Since we've been discussing continuity, now is a good time for us to introduce a new named theorem called the Intermediate Value Theorem. And we've already had one special theorem with a special name when we were doing limits. That was the Sandwich Theorem. And this is our second named theorem. And basically, if a theorem's important enough to get a name, it's kind of a big deal. Um, we'll point those out in calculus whenever we run across them. In this case, the intermediate value theorem basically says if, if you have continuity of a function, if a function is continuous and you know you achieve a couple of y values, then you're going to automatically hit uh, all the y values in between those two y values. For example, if my roller coaster is sitting here at w, the only way I can get down to z is if I cross x and y. That's kind of the gist of this thing. It's a lame example, but it's something to get us thinking about uh, continuous functions. Let me switch over to slides here, and let's go ahead and state the intermediate value theorem, and then we'll run through some examples where we try to understand the consequences of the intermediate value theorem, and ultimately um, take a look at the kinds of problems that we'll solve with the intermediate value theorem. So this is the statement of the intermediate value theorem, and a lot of times we'll call this the IVT. If f is a continuous function on a closed interval a, b, then f takes every value between f of a and f of b. And I want to just point out some special parts about this theorem. Notice the requirements for using this theorem are that we have to have a continuous function and we have to be on a closed interval. If we're continuous on a closed interval, then the result is that we will take on every value between f of a and f of b. And these are y values, okay? Remember, function values are y values. Said another way, suppose k is a value between f of a and f of b. Then there's at least one number, c, in a, b, such that f of c equals k. And I want to break this one down as well. So first of all, we're saying that there's some y value between a and b. And if that's the case, then there's at least one c, which is an x value, there's at least one c in the interval such that f of c equals k. And when we state it like that, we're basically using this as an existence theorem. So let's just formally state that. The intermediate value theorem tells us that at least one c exists. At least one c exists, but it does not give us a method for finding c. And that's uh, an example of an existence theorem. So when it tells us that it, it is true or that it does exist, but doesn't tell us how to find it, that's basically an existence theorem. And that's what the intermediate value theorem is. It's telling us that there's, if, if our function is continuous, there's got to be an x in our interval that will achieve all the y values between f of a and f of b. Okay, we've used a lot of math language in talking about this theorem, but let's turn this into some practical language so that we can use it to solve some problems. So in this first example, we're going to use this picture over here and this curve y equals f of x to just answer some basic questions. And I've, I've put the theorem up here just so we can refer to it because obviously you haven't memorized it yet. Uh, but what we want to think about, first of all, are uh, is what are the necessary requirements in order to apply the theorem? Well, we already mentioned that there are two necessary requirements. Our function has to be continuous on a closed interval a, b. So I'm going to list those here. f is continuous. And, uh, on a function, on a closed interval a, b. Well, that's supposed to say interval. That's why I like the notation better. We use these square brackets to indicate that there's a closed interval. So there's a start and stop point. Once you have those requirements, then when we talk about letter k, which axis or what kind of a value is letter k? Well, k is a y value, right? k is between f of a and f of b. So k is a y value 
on the y-axis. And you can see that right here. Okay, is a y value on the y-axis. And then this last question here, C is on which axis? Well, C is in AB, meaning that C is an x value on the x-axis. And there goes my bad penmanship again. Couldn't let that one stand. So there are actually uh, three examples of C here that all have the same K value. This one, actually, yes, one, two, three. So all these guys are C. They're all between A and B on the x-axis. Okay, let's take a look at another example. So we're going to consider this new function f here. It's this solid black curvy thing on this picture. First of all, we just want to make sure f is continuous, and we can do visual, visual verification that it is. We don't see any asymptotes, holes, or jumps. So we're going to say, yes, f is continuous. Let's take a look at letter k over here. Is k between f of a and f of b? Yes, that's true. In this example, if a is less than c is less than b, in other words, they're saying is c is between a and b, then they are blank, so this is a question, c's such that f of c equals k. So basically we're looking for all the x values that have a y value of k in between a and b. So you take the dashed line where k is and see how many places it intersects with your function. And in our interval, we have three c's. There are three places where our curve intersects with that horizontal line y equals k. And then what we're going to do is label the C, C1, C2, C3, and so on. So here's C1 on the x-axis. Here's C2 on the x-axis. And here's C3 on the x-axis. Remember, these Cs, they're just x values. So they are actual numbers on the x-axis. They're not these ordered pairs that make the dots up here. So these are not Cs. The x-coordinate of those points are the Cs. This example is really just to drive home the idea that there could be more than one place where your function achieves that y value k. All our theorem tells us is that there's going to be at least one. Okay, on the next slide we're going to actually tackle the type of problem that you'll be solving now that we've had a little bit of an understanding of the intermediate value theorem. This example asks us to verify that the intermediate value theorem applies to the following function f of x over the interval 5 halves comma 4. Explain why the intermediate value theorem guarantees an x value of c where f of c equals 6 and then find c. So this looks like it's just a simple one sentence problem but there's several things going on. The first thing we're asked to do is verify that the intermediate value theorem applies. So before we can even talk about the intermediate value theorem, we have to make sure that it's continuous on this interval. So take a quick look at this function. This f of x here, this is a um, rational function. And I notice right away that there is a discontinuity at x equals 1. So x cannot equal 1. So that's a concern for me because my function has to be continuous on the closed interval. So I take a look. Ooh, I just moved some stuff around there, didn't I? How did I do that? Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, I take a look at this interval here, 5 halves to 4, and I breathe a sigh of relief because 1 is not in that interval. So there are no other points of discontinuity other than that 1. So in this case, f of x is continuous. on 5 halves comma 4. And our evidence is that the only point of discontinuity is this x equals uh, 1 here. So we'll check that off the list. Now we want to talk about why the intermediate value theorem guarantees an x value c where f of c is equal to 6. Well, to do that, we need to have an a and a b so we can find an f of a and an f of b. So typically this interval is a comma b, right? So let's go ahead and compute f of 5 halves 
and f of 4. And then I can show you why the intermediate value theorem guarantees that we're going to hit 6. So voila, what I did is I typed the function in on Desmos and then had Desmos calculate f of 5 halves, which we can see here is 5.83 repeating, and f of 4, which we can see here is 6.6 .6 repeating. Essentially at 2.5 we're down here somewhere, and at 4 we're up here somewhere. And then notice on our graph, this is our k value. Okay, so because f of a is at 5.83 something, and f of b is at 6.6 .6 something, our intermediate value theorem guarantees us that we're going to have some c between 5, and 5 over 2 and 4, where c equals 6, because 5.83 is less than or equal to 6, is less than or equal to 6.6 .6 repeating. In other words, 6 is between these two numbers. Okay, the last thing we're asked to do then is to find C. So finding C uh, is a little more of an art than a, than a science. Obviously, we can go over here and kind of fake it um, to look at the graph, but another thing we can do is simply set our function equal to uh, 6 and solve for it. And so that's what I'm going to do here. So let's just do this down here at the bottom. We won't start a new slide. We're going to have x squared plus x over x minus 1 equals 6. Since uh, x does not equal 1 because we're not on that interval, we can multiply both sides by x minus 1 and cancel these out. And this is going to be a quadratic. I get x squared plus x equals 6x minus 6. And if we slide those... Um, terms from the left from the right over the left we get x squared minus 5x plus 6 equals 0 and that factors to x minus 2 and x minus 3 huh I did something wrong no I didn't um, there are two solutions x equals 2 and x equals 3 I almost had a brain meltdown there but Luckily, I saved myself. And thank goodness that x equals 3 is in our interval 5 over 2 comma 4, right? 2 is not in our interval because 5 over 2 is 2.5. So 2 is not between 2.5 and 4, but 3 is. So for us, in this problem, we're going to say that c equals 3. The intermediate value theorem does apply here because f is continuous on our closed interval. And we know that there must be at least one place where our function equals 6 because at the endpoints we equal 5.83 and 6.6. .6. To get from 5.83 to 6.6 .6 with a continuous function, there's no way to get there without crossing y equals 6. Once you do that, you know, you can either guess and check, or in this case we have the function, so we set it equal to 6 and we solve, and we locate our c. So the intermediate value theorem shows us that these values exist. Just want to wrap this up on our last slide here with a little um, general discussion for how you'll solve some of our problems. In this problem, we're asked to show that this equation, x cubed minus 15x plus 1 equals 0, has three solutions in negative 4, 4. Three solutions, that means it's going to cross the x-axis in three, at least three places uh, in this interval. Negative 4 to 4. So here's a way we can do this without getting too um, technical. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start computing some values of this function f of x equals x cubed minus 15x plus 1. So I'm considering this, this expression here to be 
uh, the function f, and then I'm going to demonstrate that it does have zeros. It crosses the x-axis. So I've done some calculations, and I happen to know that f of negative 4, which is the first endpoint, that happens to be negative 3. And uh, f of negative 1 happens to be 15. So if I'm out here on, uh, let's call this negative 4, and I'll call this negative 1. If my y value is negative 3 at negative 4, and if my y value is 15 at negative 1, then somewhere between negative 4 and 1, at uh, negative 1, I have a 0. There's no way to draw a continuous curve from uh, the lower dot to the upper dot without crossing at least once. Now I'm going to draw something crazy and then erase it. Just so you know, it might cross more than one time, right? Uh, but we know that there's a minimum of one time that we have to cross the x-axis to get from negative 3 to 15. And I did a few more calculations. I did f of 1, and f of 1 happens to be negative 13. So if I'm over here at 1 on the x-axis, I'm way down here at negative 13. Just pretend that's negative 13. And again, to go from positive 15 to, or from, yeah, positive 15 to negative 13. I didn't write that down, did I? I said it, but I didn't write it down. This is, uh, I wrote it in the wrong place. Holy moly. This is f of positive 1. All of these x values have to be in this interval 4 to negative 4, negative 4 to 4. So to get down, to get from 15 down to negative 13, I have to cross the x-axis at least once. It doesn't necessarily have to be at the origin like I've drawn it there, but it's somewhere in there. And then finally, I computed um, f of 4, because that's the other endpoint. That's a 4. And that worked out to be positive 5. So if I'm out here at 4, I've got a y value up here somewhere at 5. And again, to get there, I've got to cross the x-axis at least once. So I've shown three solutions. I've demonstrated that, right? It says show that the equation has three solutions. The intermediate value theorem helps me guarantee that we have those. There's more math that goes into this um, and to, to show us that those are the only three solutions, which I don't want to discuss right now, but I've shown three solutions, and for now, that's going to be enough for our discussion of the intermediate value theorem. Okay. Good luck with these problems. Uh, we're wrapping up continuity and thus wrapping up limits so that we can transition into start to talk about derivatives. Take care.